There are several ways to actually print something in Golang and you might not know all of them. That's why in this video we are going to quickly talk about 5 to 6 different ways to actually print something to the console in Golang. So let's get started. Okay, let's talk about the first kind of way to print something to the console and it's actually the most obvious way to print something to the console. And we are going to look at fmt.println but also fmt.println. So let's just say that we do have a name here and the name is Pete and then we also have an age and this age might be 33 for instance. Okay, and now there are two ways to actually print these two variables to the console for like for instance, debugging purposes. So what we could obviously leverage here is the print line functionality. And then we could say, let's just say name and then name. And then we also have H without an L and then H. Now, what you see here is actually the kind of default way of printing things to the console. And what you may also notice is if you didn't notice this before, we actually do not have any spaces between the individual parameters. The reason for that is that print line automatically adds a space between the parameters. That really means that in the end we have something like name and then Pete and then we have H and then 33. We can validate this obviously through just running go run main.go. And what we see is kind of the space separated way of printing this debugging information here. But there's also a different way of kind of printing these two variables and that is the printf function. So let's just quickly leverage this function here by just calling fmt.printf and then we say name and then percent as I'm going to talk about that in a minute here. And then we say let's just add a comma and then we say h and then present d backslash n name and h. Now printf just naturally prints something in a kind of format and these percent s and percent d's are so called verbs or placeholders. Now it's also worth noting that this printf functionality that does not add a new line to the end, right? So print line always adds a new line in the end. But for printf in this case, we just have to add this manually here. Now, when should you actually use print line and when should you actually use printf? Now, print line just generally converts the values to their default string representation. And like I said before, it always adds like a new line character at the end of the output and automatically inserts spaces between the arguments. And specifically for debugging purposes, purposes, fmd.println is a valid option and is also my go-to option. Now, when it comes to printf, clearly I think there are more complex examples, but it's definitely easier to read and looks a bit cleaner than the print line version. And it does not automatically add a new line character, so that's also good to know here. So basically the primary reason when you should use printf is just when you want to kind of control the formatting of your string. Now I've already highlighted this percent %s and percent %d's and these are verbs or placeholders like I said earlier. And there are more verbs and placeholders here for just formatting our string. Let's quickly take a look at these different placeholders. So what I will do is quickly create a structure called person and then we have a name and an age as well. Then in our main function we quickly initialize a new person here and then we just print f something to the console here and then we use percent plus v. Now this can look a bit weird, but let me quickly explain what is going on here. So like I said earlier, there are different kind of ways to format your string. And let's just quickly highlight all of them. So there is percent %s, which basically stands for formatting a string. Then we have percent %d, which is natural for an integer. We have percent %f, which is a float. Right. And here the cool thing is we can actually leverage something like percent %f and then between percent and the f character, we say 0.2, which just lets us control the precision of formatting this float, which is a really cool way of kind of truncating the float if you really want to. Then we have percent %d, which is for a Boolean, and you can also get the type of a specific variable with percent %t, capitalized T, which in the end just returns the type, of the specific variable. Now then we have percent %v which is the default kind of formatter. So percent %v just leverages the default format of the value here. And then we also have percent plus %v which is really great for structs here. 
and I'm going to demonstrate why this is the case in a minute. And then we also have percent this hashtag symbol and then V, which generally formats the variable in the Go syntax representation. Now you will use these formatters quite often whenever you leverage some kind of formatting functionality. So what we got here, let's just add the new line in the end. And then if we now going to run this program, what we will see is the struct and the variable values, which is pretty cool. So basically this percent plus V just prints the whole struct with its values. Now let's just say that we also have a slice, right? Let's just create a simple slice. For instance, we have here a slice called S and then we just initialize it with one, two, three. Let's just comment the P variable here. And then we say percent hashtag V and then we say S. So what we get now is the Go syntax representation of this specific variable, which can be quite useful for certain scenarios. All right, now with that out of the way, let's just quickly remove all of this code here. Now a really beautiful thing in Golang is that you can leverage color to kind of colorize your text in the console. And these colors work through using these NZ escape codes or ANSI escape codes. And these escape codes are just sequences of characters, which when printed to the terminal, control various text formatting options, including the color boldness, for instance, or other kind of formatting things. Now, it's really important to know that this works only as long as the terminal emulator supports ANSI or ANSI codes. This is mostly true for most Unix-like systems, but you can also use libraries if you really want to have some color in your life. Okay, let's just quickly demonstrate these colors here. Let's just create a const group and here we say reset and then we say 033 which is an octal number and then we say opening square bracket om now this reset sequence is kind of important if you want to change the color or the text formatting in the text directly so let's just say for instance that you have red for the first two words but then you do not want to use red anymore and that's where you use this reset sequence now what does this string here really means because this looks kind of cryptic so what we got here is the 033 and this is like i said before an octal number and this octal number usually stands for the escape character and this is the standard kind of nz escape sequence start way. So we usually start our NZ escape codes with the escape character. And the escape character is in an octal number representation 033. Now then we have this opening square bracket and this is just a control sequence introducer where arguments and the command itself follows. And then we have the basic colors. Now the colors generally are defined between 30 and 37 followed by the letter M. And this M character usually signals that this sequence ends here. So for instance, if we want to define the color red, we could easily leverage 033 and then opening square bracket. And then we say 31M. That's really simple. So let's just add another color. Let's just say we want to have green here, which is 32 in this case. So now we have two colors. How can we actually leverage them now in our printing functionality. So what we could do is fmt.println. Let's just use fmt.println here. And then we say red plus this is red. And then we do want to reset again. Right? This way we are just getting one single printing line here in this is red in actually the red color. So let's just have the same thing for green as well. This is green. And if we're going to run this program now, we will actually see two colors, which is really nice. Now there's also a way to kind of increase the brightness of a specific color. In this case, it is actually the boldness of a specific color. And we can do this by leveraging something else. So what we can do, let's just say this is bright yellow. Now I'm going to do this without any constant here. So we are going to say 033, which is the octal number and escape code for escape. And then we say opening bracket 33, which is yellow. And then we say semicolon and then 1M. And then we say reset here again. Now this just combines two specific formatting options together. In this case, it is the color yellow and the formatting option or the increasing of the brightness for this specific color. So if we now run this program here, what we actually get is a bold way of printing this is bright yellow. 
which you can actually see as well. Now you can do so much more with these NZ escape codes, but this will do it for now. And I will probably make a separate video just for these escape codes. Okay, let's just get back to Pete here quickly. Let's remove the consent and let's add Pete again. And the next thing I actually want to show you is using Sprint F instead of string concatenation. Now Sprint F generally can be used to format a string, which will not be printed, but saved in a string variable. So what we can do here is let's just say information and we want to kind of format a specific string but we do not want to really print it anywhere we just want to save it in the information variable to maybe leverage it later at some point so what we could do is just say sprintf so fmt.sprintf and then we say name we use the formatting placeholders or verbs in this case here again and then we say name and age and now we have this string here which is formatted, right, as a variable. So in the end, information is now name and age. So this is now information, right? And clearly now we can leverage this information by just printing it, for instance. Now, what is the specific use case for this sprintf functionality? Generally, I would use this sprintf functionality whenever I need formatting. So for instance, building complex strings or including variable values within the output. And then I want to leverage this generated string further in my code by combining it with some other string or doing some validation on it or something else. So basically you want to use printf in this case, whenever you want to print a formatted string to the console and you would leverage sprintf whenever you want to use this formatted string in your code somewhere else and you want to save this information in a variable. Okay, let's just look at another way. Let's just use error f in this case. Now, error f is just a versatile function that creates error values with formatted messages. It combines the formatting capabilities we've actually seen here with percent %s and percent %d with error creation, which is pretty cool. Okay, so what we can do is create a global variable called error under 18. Now, I'm going to quickly demonstrate that we can use this error f functionality without any formatting as well. So I will say here is under 18 error as the error message. And as you can see, if we hover over the error f function, this error f function actually expects a string. And then we can leverage the formatting capabilities in this specific string. And then this error f returns the error itself. So it kind of creates a new error out of a formatted string. So let's just create quickly a function called validate h. And then this validate h expects a parameter called h and returns a possible error. By default, it just returns nil because we don't have any error. Now, if the age is less than 18, then we can just return the error under 18. However, maybe we would like to format this custom error. So how can we do this? Because in the end, we do not really return a string here. We do return an error. And here we can actually leverage the error f function again. And what we'll do is h and then percent %d and then we say percent %w. And then we just say h and then error under 18. Now this percent %w is kind of new, but you can leverage this percent %w only for error values. Okay, let's just leverage this validate h function. And we have this information with sprint f here. Let's just keep this as it is and just print it to the console. And then we basically just call this function, right? Validate h and then h and then check if the arrow is not equal to nil. And if the arrow is not equal to nil, we just print line the arrow here. Now, if we now run this code, all we'll actually get is name Pete and age 33. So we do not get any error because the validate age function returned nil in this case. So what about changing the age of Pete to be 17? Now, if we now run this code, we actually get age 17 and then the actual error, which is under 18 error which is pretty cool. So we can use this error f function to create custom errors based on a formatted string. Now the use case of this error f function is pretty simple whenever you want to kind of have a way to add context to a specific error. Now another thing I actually want to show you is this log module. And let's just first clarify what is even 
slog or what is log slash slog. Now with this log module, you can easily create a structured and flexible logger built for real applications instead of using fmt.println or just using the log functionality. Now this was introduced in Golang 1.21 and it probably deserves its own video because it can be much more useful than this right here. All right, let's just leverage this log package by just using slog and then we import it and then we can just have different kind of ways of printing something to the console or logging something to the console what we could use is debug right let's just say debug message here we could also do the same with for instance info warn and error i think this is pretty standard so far and there's nothing really special compared to the log package now obviously we can set the log logger level here to something like level debug to actually see the debug message as well so by default the level is actually at the info level right so this will not be printed we can actually demonstrate this here if we just comment this out and if we now run go run main.go we will actually see the debug message i actually need to change the strings here as well but if we save this again and run this one more time we will actually see info warn and error and if we now uncomment this set log logger level function we will actually see all four function outputs here okay so far nothing really special but like i said in the beginnings log can do a lot more than just logging something to the console it can actually add some structure to the logging so let's just add this here let's just create a new logger and then we say slog.new. Now there are different ways of kind of structuring your log output or kind of handlers that you can use to structure your logging output, but we are going to just leverage here the new JSON handler. And in here, we are just going to leverage OS STD out and then nil. Now, like I said, there's also the new text handler, which just formats accordingly to the log FMT standard. And it's important to note that you can also write your own handler for this log package, because in the end, this kind of new function right here just takes in an implementation of the handler interface. And this handler interface kind of in the end determines how the logs are formatted and where are they written to. And with this new JSON handler function, this takes in an IO writer interface. So we could also use here a file, for instance. And then the second parameter of this new JSON handler function are the handler options, which we set to nil in this case here. And the rest here basically stays the same. So we can say logger.debug, logger.info, and then we say logger.warn as well logo.error as well. Now debug is not used in this case because obviously we did not set the level to the bug, so it only defaults to the info level here. And if we are now going to run this code, what we'll actually see is a structured output of our debugging output, which is pretty cool and can be really useful if you want to have structured logging output. Okay, now hopefully you will benefit from these smaller things and you now understand how to leverage the most common formatting functions in Golang. If you are also curious about creating a custom TCP echo server from scratch in Golang, then I highly recommend watching this video here. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, have a lovely day and bye bye.